Hello and welcome to Boring Dad Gaming, where today we're going to be playing Tiny Bunny as part of our Spooktober fest. Well, is it a fest? I don't know. Spookytober is kind of what I'm calling it, isn't it? Um, so yeah, so this is uh, this was recommended to me actually by a commenter, uh, uh, Dat Boy, on uh, I think it was one of my Scarlet Hollow videos. So I went and looked at the Steam page and thought, hey, you know, actually this looks really good. <laughs> so, uh, so I bought it and I thought I'd play it as, as part of this month's uh, games. So yeah, it's uh, another horror visual novel type thing, I think. Um, and it is still in early access. I think they've done three of five chapters completed as, as part of this. So playing through, we'll be playing through th three of those. I know that's kind of the opposite of what I said for Scarlet Hollow. Um, but hey, I'm nothing if not inconsistent. So let's start a new let's start a new game here. The wind clawed at my window all night long. It wandered the fields and howled like a hungry beast. An endless song, weaved from all sorts of voices, shrill, gentle, sneery, twined in the air. They were shouting and laughing and arguing about something. Some woman was running through the snow while casting long shadows that would occasionally creep close to my bed. Our house had a mind of its own, the creaky old mind of a building that had seen a lot in its days and was seemingly trying to share its wisdom with the inhabitants. The lonely house faced the forest, and the dark green thicket gazed back with its hollow eyes, rustling, whizzing, swaying back and forth. And we've got things at the bottom here, I'm not quite sure what they do. Oh, okay, so we can go back on the... Ah, okay, so yeah, we can get, if we miss something we can go back and see, see what was said. I th presume that'll just automatically do stuff without me clicking, so yeah, okay. One could come out and stand at the edge of the forest to reassure themselves. There was nobody behind the crooked trees. Fuzzy silhouettes swaying in the wind couldn't possibly do any harm. It's just a play of light and shadow. Just a play. I knew it was just my imagination. I was already twelve, after all. Still. Oh, there's a little raccoon thing there. Episode 1, The Owl Will Arrive. Okay, so it's a. Uh, maybe if it's if it, maybe you speak Russian or, or whatever that is, you can understand it. But we'll got the English uh, text here. Hey, put away your book. How many times have I told you not to read at the table? It's bad for your health. Look how slouched you are. Okay, that just says hide. Oh, is that? That's us, okay. <laughs> I didn't protest and put the book about Conan the Barbarian aside. I was stuck on a line I couldn't understand after reading it three times, anyway. Olya had already finished her breakfast and was munching on some cookies. She was so enthusiastic she almost looked like your typical girl from commercials. You're not going anywhere until you finish all of it. I, on the other hand, was still trying to drill a hole in the plate with my eyes as if it would make the porridge disappear. Hazy anxiousness welled up inside, all because of the previous sleepless night, the black forest around our house, and the gloomy wind. The longer I waited, the colder the lumpy white substance became. It looked like a jellyfish from the Cousteau Odyssey. I love that show. I wonder how horrifying the bottom of the ocean is, or how cold the black forest is at night. The spoon fell out of my hand. Mum showered me with a cold glare from her green eyes. What did I just say? I'll get it. I had ten seconds to catch my breath before battling the nasty porridge once again. I felt around for the spoon. Wait, what is this carved on the other side of the table? Karina. Hey, that's my mum's name. I guess she carved it out with something pointy when she was little. She sure was a rascal, damaging the furniture like that. She would scold me for a week if I did something similar, though. Should I remind her about it? No. She's been in a better. She's been in a bit of a bad mood lately. 
I imagined her being my age, sitting under this table. I wonder, was Mum afraid of the dark back then? Or the sounds coming from the attic? Or the thick forest? I imagine my grandma coming into my little mum's room, sitting at the edge of her bed, where Olya sleeps nowadays, and saying this in her smooth, soft, smooth voice. Tiger is a special... Tiger is a special place, little girl. It's watching you closely, sniffing you out. Trying to discern what kind of beast you are. If you're a good sort, it won't abandon you in times of trouble. But if you're a bad apple, it'll grab you by the side and drag you under the ground. And that would be it. Just going to go into the menu. Because it's in Russian... I wonder if I can just mute the voices. Um, just because... If I'm talking over them, I'm recording this, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think I've set the volume low enough, but I don't want to be obscured. Uh, by the sort of Russian acting. So, I hope that's okay. Grandma was caring. She never fought with anybody, never yelled, never swore. Those were the times without the maddening screams until late at night, without smashed dishes and mutual accusations. Our parents used to love each other back then. I remember listening in on one of their conversations by chance. They were talking about Grandma getting prepared for her funeral. She had already bought a casket and she called it her cute funeral box. It waited for its time in the closet, patiently. It was black, upholstered with meat-coloured material on the inside. I saw it where my grandma was getting buried. The house didn't change since the time she was alive. Only all of the photos were gone. Feels like the music's pretty loud as well. I'm sorry, let me just go in and... Yeah, let's make these a little bit quieter, just in case. Glass-covered pictures with grey faces of my ancestors. They all had a dead but watchful look in their eyes. I crawled out from under the table. Olya was done with her cookies and was looking at my share like a sly woodland critter. I turned my gaze towards the frosted window. There were a lot of dark pines outside, but they didn't grab my attention. The pattern of frost formed a picture on the glass. Oh, it was a fox, yeah, yeah. Olya, look, it's a fox! Where? It looked almost like those optical illusion thingies they put on the back of student notebooks. A mixture of lines at first glance, but if you blow your vision a little bit, and look under a certain angle... Not outside, on the window! Look, here's the nose, and here's... Hey, eat up! Yes, yes, just a moment. I don't see anything. Hurry up, there's not much left. Ah, there it is, but it still doesn't look like one. And I'm telling you, it does. Nuh uh. It does! Oh, stop it, these kids, I swear! Now I couldn't see the fox either. It disappeared. Went away. Only the frosty pattern similar to stretched out nettle leaves kept creeping up the glass. My dad into the kitchen with long measured steps. I want to have a beard like his when I grow up. Mum would always ask jokingly, come on shave it off it stings. This was so long ago. Nowadays rumbling doors and witty comebacks were an everyday occurrence. Olya always covers her ears whenever she hears something like, what's the point of all this, through the wall. It's all for your sake, Dad would reply, for the sake of our family. I always caught every sound in, f I always caught every sound in fear of hearing the most dreaded, deadliest word that started with a D. D-I-V-O. I didn't even want to finish it. It was scary to imagine that me and my little sister could be torn apart and taken into two different families. Anyway, your fox is nothing. I have an owl on my window. You and your owl talk again. You said you believe... Oh, sorry. <laughs> you said you believed me just yesterday. Has anybody seen my car keys? I remember leaving them on the windowsill. Right. Maybe you did and maybe not. 
You're a grown man, a father of two, and still... Karina, please stop. Just let me get ready in peace. Your keys are in the basket near the phone. Well, thank you very much. Anton, stop making a martyr out of yourself and finish eating breakfast already. But the owl... There was no owl. But there was one. It had giant glowing eyes. Olya sprung up from the chair and placed her hands on her little face, imitating a pair of eyes with her fingers, the size of an apple each. Last year you had Babai in your closet, and now this owl? But, but, but I saw it. Olya shifted her gaze back and forth from Dad to Mum to me, but couldn't find any support. Have you thought about befriending it? You know, like feeding it with imaginary mice? Don't bully our girl. She's just afraid to sleep alone because she's little. Olya pouted her lips in rebellion and rushed into the hallway. The staircase that led to the second floor creaked. Mum gave Dad a strict look. Oh, that look in her eyes. It's so uncomfortable to be pinned under it. Dad just snorted in reply and left, ringing with the keys he just found. A minute had passed, and the theme song from The Little Mermaid echoed through the house. It was stored on an incredibly worn-out cassette tape, which Dad had already had to glue together once. It's easy to fix objects, by gluing them back together, for example. But how do you fix a relationship? Mum moved to the living room, and I was left alone, anxiously stealing glances at the window. Olya had trouble sleeping ever since we moved to this house. She would toss and turn or curl up into a ball under her blanket. Sometimes she would jump up in the middle of the night and turn on the VCR. Cartoons helped to take her mind off all the troubles we had with the move and our parents. And then Olya said she saw that giant flying monster outside her window. She became obsessed with it. Our parents did everything in their power. They tried every little trick to get rid of those ridiculous fears. Olya refused to sleep alone and didn't believe that the owl was just one of her nightmares. After last night, I was unsure what to make of my sister's words, what to think of it myself. Can nightmares be infectious? That night I couldn't get a wink of sleep and ended up thinking of what to expect from my new school. There were a couple of days left before the beginning of a new term. My imagination drew long, twisting hallways that led to a classroom full of kids. But all the students behind their desks were simply dark figures cut out using a template. Circular holes gaped in the middle of their faces, and pairs of eyes blinked inside those holes. It was as if some completely different creatures were looking at me from behind the flat, black silhouettes. Their cruel glares filled with icy sneers made me shiver from head to toe. Will I survive here? Won't they gang up on me and beat me down, stomp on me with their bloodied shoes? The damn school can burn for all I care. I just wished for anything to happen to it, doesn't really matter what. I didn't want to go there that badly. I didn't want to see people who were just itching to smack me on the head, trip me up, think of a new offensive name for me worse than the previous one. I felt like the glasses I wore made me an outsider, or some sort of a monster. My glaze... <laughs> my gaze slid across the drawings hanging on the walls. I couldn't consider myself a great artist, but Olya begged me to hang them. Drawing was the only thing that made me happy as a plate. The small circle of friends I had also enjoyed my paintings, and they promised to call me from time to time. Sometimes I imagined Mum picking up the phone and saying in a cold voice, You've got the wrong number! Or, Anton is not around. Anton is not around. I imagined my future classmates lying in their beds just like me, listening to the howls of invisible werewolves outside their windows. Maybe my new classmates will like me, after all. But who would ever like a boy with thick glasses? I mean, my dad used to wear glasses when he was little, and now he's married to the most beautiful woman on the planet, my mum. The house creaked, pressed by the wind. The condo we used to live in, a nine-floor concrete building, buzzed with a neighbour's drill, mumbled with a TV set from behind the wall, cried like a baby from the big family next door. Our current house, though I can't really call it new, was completely different.
It was silent and easy going during the day. Its shadows lay dormant in the corners, on the closet, cobwebs, and under the stairs. But they all woke up during the night. Something was watching me from every corner, almost as if the old paintings of my deceased family, with their ashen eyes, were hanging on the walls in place of my drawings. The floor was squeaking, rusty drains were moaning, the attic was occupied by noisy draughts. One could think the house was performing some sort of demonic melody. And then I realised I was, in fact, hearing music. It was already playing for a good while. Somewhere at the edge of my perception, I could hear a flute. It was mixed in with the sound of the wind, of the creaking old house, and my thoughts too. I stood up and rushed to the window. I wanted to reassure myself that this music was nothing more than a product of my imagination. It's not like someone is playing it there amidst the cold, snowy night, right? Someone was dancing in the field. Black silhouettes I could barely make out, with the dark forest as their backdrop. They jumped around, basked in the moonlight, bumped into piles of snow, rolled around and crawled on all fours. Stories about wolves playing under the moon came to mind. But these were clearly not wolves. I mean, some of them looked like wolves. They stood upright at times, circled around holding hands and whipping up snow, disappearing into the shadows for a brief moment, and then coming back. Something bizarre was going on. Shadows dancing in the starless abyss made my imagination go wild, making me anxious at the same time. Suddenly, the music stopped. Look, they've stopped dancing. The dancing shadows froze in place, and, I could swear, pierced me with their eyes. One of the silhouettes immediately parted from the bizarre shadow carnival and sprinted across the field with giant leaps. It glided on squeaky snow, without leaving any prints until it was devoured by the pitch-black shadow of my house, which became even darker and thicker. My heart was jumping around like the, a bird inside a cage. I shut the curtains with a swift motion and stepped back towards the bed. They saw me. A freezing torrent of fear washed over me. I stood in the middle of a perfectly dark room and listened to some unwanted guest move and scrape around, looking for an entrance. Oh, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. <laughs> the sound moved to the right, then circled around the house. Now my guest should be at the front door. I jumped into the bed and covered myself with a blanket as if it could protect me. The shackles of fear locked my muscles. I remember the funeral, my grandma lying there, hands crossed on her chest, her facial features sharp like that of a tin doll. Ants running up and down the legs of chairs that held my grandma's casket. I imagine those little creatures climbing up her head and pulling up her eyelids with their tiny legs. Ooh. Then her wrinkly eyeballs would once again move inside their sockets and she'd be able to see her grandchildren. I was chanting the spell she taught me throughout the whole procedure. And now, lying under the blanket and listening to the squeaks and howls, I was repeating the same words. On the island of Buyan, underneath the blemished sun, in the sea of colour blue, stands a cabin made of wood. There lay hard and ashen hair, for the spawn from devil's lair, to feast and always leave alone, God's faithful servant named Anton. Anton. Evil leave this house must, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Bizarre sounds had disappeared. I cautiously peeked out from under the blanket and saw curtains waving around like a hanged man. And then the night doused me with a new portion of boiling terror. Oh, the sound scratched at my eardrums. In reality, something or someone was scratching at the front door, hurriedly clawing at wood demanding to be let in. The door was shut. Dad had become very cautious recently, so he installed a sturdy lock. I remember him staring at the forest intently, as if he was looking for someone. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I hugged my knees, placing my chin between them, and drilled the door with my eyes. It was so flimsy and weak before the might of darkness. And then... The doorknob twitched, slightly. Then it turned halfway, once, twice, as if the person who tried to enter had no hands. The 
doorknob tilted once more and then started clicking violently my jaw cramped from fear my wet fingers clutched the blanket the door creaked and opened the wind taunted me moaning inside the tin drains now you'll see the door was wide open the darkness oh, I'm hoping it's Olya the darkness writhed inside the carnivorous mouth of a doorway too shall it was as if the night itself was calling out to me flapping its black wings and squeaking with rusty hinges I was trembling ensnared by the web of darkness that hung in the corners of my room waiting for the ones who weaved it to come out of the gaping black hole to me. My abdomen tightened and my chest rose up, ready to exhale a desperate scream. But before I was able to do anything, the darkness asked me, Tosha, you asleep? Olya, I've never been so pleased to see you. <laughs> my sister's pale face protruded from the thick shadows. I almost screamed from relief. Olya? Oh no, Olya, I'm not, I'm not sleeping. D did something happen? Olya frowned and stuck out her lower lip, a clear sign that she was about to cry. It's there again, staring at me. Shoo her away, Tosha, please. I'm so scared. The fear that was tormenting me just a minute ago crawled away and hid somewhere in my stomach. I needed to calm Olya down. It was just a dream, silly. Don't be scared. Dreams don't bite. No one's going to harm you. Olya sobbed. She was trying her best to believe me. But was I sure myself? I have an idea. Let's go to your room and watch the video Sleeping Beauty, for example. You like that cartoon, don't you? Why does the Sleeping Beauty have a prince and I have this scary bird? That question took me by surprise. Alright, let's watch Cinderella. My thoughts became tangled, fuzzy. What was that? What studied me with its eyes while dancing feverishly under the moon? The darkness was clinging to the window, and it couldn't be fooled by my grandma's old chants. It couldn't be satisfied with a feast of lard and long, ashen hair. Tosh, are you coming? Yes, yes, just a moment. Oh, Jesus. Okay. That's why I didn't want to laugh at Olya and her owl in the morning. Who could be visiting us here in the middle of nowhere? We didn't know anyone around here. So persistent. I felt extremely unsettled just from a silly thought that our morning guests could have come from the woods. I could barely hear voices coming from the front door. My mind was urging me to hide. In the closet. Under the table. Behind the curtains where Olya always hides. Tosha, come here! I felt like kettlebells were tied to my feet, but still dragged them towards the hallway. A couple of policemen towered over me in the doorway. They smelled like frost and worry. My mum always winced and grumbled the moment she saw patrol cars. Worse than bandits. At the moment, though, she looked somewhat confused. Hello? The senior officer, who wore a grim expression, nodded. The boy has gone missing yesterday. His name's Vova. Look at this, please. Have you seen him? The policeman held out a photograph to me. There was a ginger boy around the age of elementary school, pictured with a wall carpet as the backdrop. He had a striped cat in his hand, and wore a wide smile. N no, I haven't. Are you sure? Look closely. I don't know why he's rushing and no one else is. Where would I see him? I don't know anyone around here. I, I barely leave the house. Well, maybe you've seen him from the window. That's right, your windows look straight at the forest, don't they? The window. No, I haven't seen anything. I see. He sounded tired, but his eyes... 
His stare, long and heavy, was full of suspicion. I squirmed unwittingly under the weight of guilt which his giant shadow cast over me. The policeman finally tore his eyes from me and glanced over the hallway, the stairway and the cracks in the ceiling, which I hadn't noticed before for some reason. How do you like your new place, by the way? Getting used to it? Bit by bit, it's just our little daughter misses the city a lot. Misses the city, huh? Have the locals been treating you well? Yes, everything's all right, thank you. The policeman pierced through me one more time with his brown eyes. My head started spinning. Um, can I help you somehow? I asked that in a shaky voice to look like a polite boy and to end this unpleasant, unpleasant conversation sooner. Now that I think about it, you look just like one of my nephews, little fella. He's a witty boy around your age, wears the same type of goggles, ha. Huh? Always engrossed in reading these uh, mystery novels. Told me he wants to enroll in police school when his family visited this summer. Wanted to help other people, just like me, see? I felt uncomfortable, as if a distant relative and not a police officer stood before me. You know what? Little boys like you should stay at home, steer away from trouble. The times have changed so much. Mum inter interjected in a cold voice. You don't say? Ah, well then. What grade are you in, Anton? Sixth? Have you made any friends here so far? Not yet. I'll be going to school for the first time after the break. Ah, then I'll leave you my number just in case. Call me if you have any new info. The policemen were gone along with their shadows. The smell of cheap cologne and the photograph of a smiling boy. His face still stood before my eyes. I wondered what it was like for him being all alone. There. For some reason I thought of the forest swaying in the wind. What did his poor parents feel? And what would my parents do if I'd gone missing? Would they cry and thrash around hysterically? Or would they accuse each other, like they always do, and forget about me, eventually? Mum, this Volva, did he go missing in our forest? Seems like it, poor child. I looked out the window at the road. The police UAZ drove off towards the village. The officer's nephew came to mind while I was splitting off old paint from the windowsill. I remembered all the teenage mystery novels from the Black Kitty series I've read this summer. Okay, so when things are underlined, we've got a little glossary here. What does this say? Uh, Babai, something we have in Slavic folklore, a nocturnal spirit used by parents to threaten their ill-behaving children. UAZ, a Soviet and Russian off-road freight passenger car brand, which was produced on the Olyanovsk car factory. Black Kitty, a series of contemporary Russian original or translated teen mystery books. There we go. We'll try and, uh, when we see those, we'll click on the glossary just to make sure we understand what we're seeing. Your average boys and girls investigated all sorts of mysteries there. They looked for clues, spied on suspicious people. And after a set of amazing adventures, bam, solved any complicated case. They became local celebrities and must have made their parents very proud. I noticed a trail of policemen's footprints that led to the forest. And then it clicked in my head. Why don't I start an investigation of my own? Maybe I'll find that lost boy, and I'll get a reward. Olya will be so happy. And not only Olya, Mum and Dad too. Maybe they'll even forget about their quarrels for a while. Maybe I'll even save us from the D word. I fantasized about buying Olya a Tamagotchi and getting a cassette player and a bunch of tapes for myself and a whole box of Kinder Surprise. When was the last time our parents brought us any toys? Last autumn, I think. My dad had lost his job at the time. There's that annoying song about it. Accountant, a song by an old female Soviet pop band by the name of Kombinatsia. Combination. They became wildly popular in the early 90s. Okay. I had little to no idea what the accountant's job, what was the accountant's job like. They count money, I think? Neighbours used to envy us, but nowadays Mum and Dad barely had any money to afford sweets, and Dad would always divide a single chocolate bar between me and Olya. Sometimes I gave her my share, too. No matter how much I wanted to eat sweets, she was still just a pipsqueak. I couldn't wait to go out looking for clues. He's brave. <laughs> After last night, I don't think I would be. I'm going outside. Yeah, right. 
You want the police to go around with your photograph next? The forest is so thick. What if the boy got snatched up by wild animals, or something even worse? Even worse echoed through the hallway. I won't go far. I'll stay away from the forest. Did you hear what I said, or should I repeat myself? Better go pack your school bag or play with Olya. The sound of splashing water came from the kitchen. It meant that the argument was over, and Mum had the last word. Okay, we have a choice, and there's an eye here as well. What does that do? Oh, we can examine stuff as well, maybe? Let's have a little look. My parents prohibit me from making long-distance calls, but from time to time I really want to hear my old friends. Sometimes I would just pick up the phone, listen to the low hum of the Zuma and the distant crackling, imagining the wind howling in the ice-leaden cords. This cross had seen so many people come and go in this house. It was black, as if it absorbed all human sin from the long years it was hanging under the ceiling. After Grandma died, Mum was going to take it off and hang a horseshoe in its place as a lucky charm. But she cut herself with the cross's sharp corner and almost fell from the stepladder. Dad called it a sign from above and ordered the cross to be left alone in its rightful place. Mum's pegtop, a family relic. My mum played with it when she was little and then gifted it to me. Olya was next in the succession line. The toy belonged to her now. She stared at the dancing spindle as if it could show her something. A fairy tale, or maybe even your future. Now even my little sister was a bit too old for the squeaky peg top. The dark, stuffy closet. My mum says it smells nice, but how would she know their smell? Oh, my smell nice, okay. She hates it when I stick my nose in there. She's afraid I'll cut myself on the freshly sharpened axe. And Olya can't even be lured close to it. She thinks Babai is living there. Remember, that's like kind of the Russian boogeyman, I suppose. I tried to help her fight her fears once. I opened the door and turned on a dim lamp so she would see there was nothing but cobwebs, Dad's tools and scratched walls. She still didn't believe me. And I like to hide in the closet and listen to Olya count outside. One, two, three, better hide from me and then drag her feet on the creaking floorboards, hoping that she wouldn't need to look for me in the cramped monster's den. I was hoping to grab that axe. Um, well, I mean, let's uh, let's go outside, shall we? Anton! I'll whip you if you make a single step out the door! Let's not go outside then, let's go to the kitchen. Uh, anything to examine here? Yeah, we got the fridge. Oh, that's the policeman's phone number, I think. The side of the old ocean freezer was checkered with my childish drawings, mum's recipes, and all kinds of stickers from bubblegum with dinosaurs that Olya liked so much. Among that still-life picture hung a piece of ruled paper with the phone number of the police officer who visited us. First Lieutenant Tikhonov. I read inside my mind, looking at the officer's sprawling handwriting. A scrap of paper was held by two pieces of a broken magnet from some old Soviet toy, and those pieces just barely covered up the numbers as if to taunt me. I leaned towards it to unveil the mystery, and take the piece to a safer place where it would wait for its time when I would finally find Vova and be the first to call the police with the happy news. Anton! Mum's reproachful eyes stared at me. What do you need it for? Hands off, you'll lose it! Angering my mum was the last thing I wanted, so I lowered my hand. I took a peek at Mum's crossword. She would get very angry when someone gave her advice, so me and Dad faked knowing the answer and being about to reveal it all the time. I smiled at that fleeting thought. Vertical, nine letters. The name of the Philistine deity that protected them from viper bites and had a nickname, the Lord of Flies. I don't know. Second letter is E. Beelzebub? Hmm. What's making that noise? Emicom of Russia has declared the state of emergency due to adverse weather conditions. According to the weather forecast, a cyclone is moving towards the region. Expect heavy snowfall, blizzards and snowdrifts on the road. Keep your eyes open and take care of yourself. The decrepit and stain-covered calendar was once my favourite form of entertainment in Grandma's house. 
I remember waking up and running to the kitchen so I could tear off yesterday's leaf first thing in the morning, as if the coming day would get lost in the tiger forest without my help. One day close to New Year's. One day closer to my grandma's funeral. I haven't touched this calendar for years now. Since the time they started writing dark and spooky death chants that only made me gloomy instead of funny proverbs and superstitions, to be exact. I gra grabbed a dusty calendar leaf with caution and tore it off effortlessly. Sadly, the spooky descriptions from my childhood were still there. Seven horses carry the log. If seven can't carry, bring the eighth from a ferry. They will take it away and never come back. This is the fate the log cannot escape. Jesus, dark. I crumpled the grey leaf and threw it into the waste bin, hoping to get rid of the anxiousness that washed over me. It was spreading inside me like an ink stain on blotting paper. Alright, let's, let's open the fridge first. Uh, nothing to... Yeah, there's no eye, so I guess we don't click on anything, but we can open the freezer section. Grandma kept ice cream for me and Olya there, but now I could only see meat bits for soup and clumped together pelmeni. I grew to hate them already, and pelmeni is... A Russian variety of dumplings made by boiling thin, unleavened dough filled with mincemeat. One may even call it Russian fast food. Okay, let's go. Alright, we're going to lie to Mum. It was difficult to lie to Mum, but there was no other way for me to run away from home. Mum, something's wrong with the TV. The picture is dim, and there are stripes all over the screen. Mum's face became visibly distorted. Ugh, oh, you're killing me here. So have you had enough of shooting those stupid ducks now? Told you the kinescope will go dim because of your console. Where will we find a TV technician in this hole, huh? Maybe it's just the settings? Please, go see for yourself. Strange, it worked fine in the morning. Maybe the, maybe the snowfall caused it? Mum rubbed her hands on her apron and went to Olya's room. Alright, I guess we scamper out now while she's distracted. I opened the front gate and went to the field, carefully so Mum wouldn't see me from the window. When I crossed half of the distance towards the forest, the snow piles became as high as my knees. I remembered my nightly fears. I saw those silhouettes around here. They were jumping around, holding hands. That hypnotising music started playing in my head all on its own. In the light of the day, those distant figures felt like a simple dream. The sun turned my nightmares to ash, but the aftertaste was still there. Distant ringing in my ears, distorted shadows crawling on the snow alongside me, and a barely audible whisper in my head. Blurry, almost kind. Everything was silent. So silent I felt like the world was totally empty. No ground, no sky, no parents, no Olya time reached its limit, a one-way trip that ended at the forest's piney stockade. Sometimes silence was much scarier than any scream. Our parents would scream at each other while arguing, and both me and Olya turned to stone listening to them. But then always came the ringing silence. Our apartment became numb a couple of days before we departed. It was hard to remember the last time Mum and Dad joked around, laughing or spent time together, Almost like all of it was in a previous life. When they kissed with Olya present, she always frowned and snorted in a funny way. But one day it all changed. Something important had left our home. And something scary filled the remaining void. It was as if a fire broke out, and our parents were hurriedly packing our belongings, trying to save themselves and us. From who, though? From the people with dead, cold eyes, who sometimes visited us in our previous home. The eyes that saw only, saw only balls of worms on the black ground and everything. And somewhere far away a siren was going off, trying to warn us of the coming menace. Hmm. I shuddered, chasing away my delusions, and looked around. I think it says sport on his uh, hat. There were only me, this white field, and the wind that was whipping up icy dust and belts of powdered snow. I squinted from the sun and turned my eyes to the sunless forest. It looked especially dark in contrast with the blinding whiteness. Knobby tree roots slithered under the snow like fat snakes. Rotten leaves and coniferous needles froze into the ice. 
dry, prickly branches intertwined, bringing up uncomfortable thoughts about fences. Were they protecting the forest? Or were they keeping something from breaking out? Some object was hanging from one of the pointy branches. I tried to get closer, drowning in snow, and when I almost got to the edge of the forest I saw a knitted mitten. It looked like a wounded bird among the hungering semi-dark. Should I take it to the police? The, their senior officer looked gloomy, but he still reminded me of Captain Casanova from my favourite TV show called The Streets of Broken Lights. We'll see what that says. A Russian mystery TV series telling the story of the daily life of Russian police officers is the longest running series in the history of Russian TV at the moment. He was also always anxious, with a tired look in his eyes, but still brave and strong. Will this mitten help them find the lost boy? Vova. I heard a distant shout. It looked like it came from the river. Vova. As if the trees were calling out to someone. Vova. Resounded closer to me. Someone was standing there behind the trees, hiding. Vova. I knew someone was looking for the lost boy, but still. Something was unsettling about that figure. Can we see it on this screen? I don't think so. Oh, can we see it? It's stillness. How it was bent unnaturally towards the ground. I can't see it. It's blackness. There's no one there, just branches and roots. It's all just my imagination. A nearby bird flapped its wings loudly. Ooh, ooh. A shadow split from the... I've got a hair sticking up on the back of my neck again. A shadow <laughs> split from the tree and disappeared from my sight. I looked away for just a moment, but when I turned my gaze back to the same place, it was gone. So it was my imagination, after all. Silence reigned for a painfully long time. My muscles were tightly sprung, my heart was beating somewhere in my throat. Any noise, any little movement, any small whisper from the thicket and I'd sprint. But nothing of the sort happened. I looked at the mitten once more. Ooh, we're gonna take it. I decided to take the lonely mitten from the branch. Oh, jeez. Vova. A shout rumbled across the field and dissolved into the distance. No echo, no hope for a reply. Ah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I stepped towards the bristly trees and tried to claim my find. It didn't budge. I pulled harder. The branch cracked and the mitten tore off, landing in my hand with a squishy sound, all too heavy, wet. Oh god, I squeezed it without thinking and something dark spilled from it, forming a tiny string between the mitten and the snow. Steam rose from the snow pile. Oh, don't be a hand. I froze in place, studying my palms in disgust. Red. The sound of cracking branches invaded the silence. I didn't have to think twice before running away. Someone was chasing me from the darkness, breaking pine branches, closing the distance with giant leaps. Snow was slowing me down. Crazy thoughts th flew through my mind. I'll get caught. They'll get me. I'll get dragged into the thicket. I'll be gone. Forever. But there was one more voice, probably one of reason. He gave me strength, spurred me on. You can do it! Don't stop! I heard an animal roar behind me. It was so loud my ears went numb. I felt like the sound had come from a pack of hungry beasts rather than a single one. Their nostrils sucked in freezing air. They sensed my fear. Two giant wings flapped above my head. An enormous shadow flew over the clearing. A hoot. A wheeze. The roars were coming from all directions now. 
from the dried up raspberry bush, from twisted pines, from under the windfall. Hurry, run, don't look back. I felt like I was inside a nightmare. The snowy clearing became viscous like quicksand. I was stuck in place. I pulled my leg from the mushy trap just to be caught in a new one even deeper than before. I continued to drown, sinking deeper and deeper with every desperate push. Was snow ever this sticky? I screamed in horror after realising this wasn't snow. Someone or something in the snow pile was clutching my pants. I gathered all my strength and rushed forward. The pressure on my leg was gone, my boots slipped out of the hole and my soles were on a hard surface again. I reached a clear path with one jump and from there ran to my house. Its gloomy facade didn't look threatening now. That house was my line of defence from the shadows that flapped their wings and the creatures that were hidden under the snow. I tripped over the doorstep and smashed into the door. In all my hurry I still managed to notice the claw marks. As if a dog was striking the wood with its paws, demanding to be let in so it could escape the cold. I hadn't noticed those marks when I was leaving. The heartbeat in my ears was much louder than my surroundings. I couldn't hear whether someone was following me or not. It, it, the music may be getting too loud, <laughs> I'm not sure, but it is tense, I'll give it that. What if they were already in our front yard and Mum had locked the door? Drowning in fear, I pulled on the doorknob and it obediently gave way. I rolled into the hallway and shut the door behind me. Porch planks creaked as my pursuers ascended the stairs. My fingers slipped off the lock and I could, couldn't click it into place. I gritted my teeth and pulled hard on the iron knob, whipping it between the boards. I stared blankly at the door. Someone was standing on the other side of the pitiful, flimsy barrier that was probably less than useful, less useful than blankets. Wheezing breath reached into the house and crashed at me in waves. It smelled of pine and sweat. Mum peeked out of the kitchen and chastised me with the same frigid voice she always used when talking to Dad. What exactly didn't you understand when I told you to never slam the door? I, I didn't mean to. I snuck a glance at the door. The smell was gone, and the breath was too, if there was someone in the first place, of course. Here, mere five metres away from Mum, my fear was slowly weakening, melting like snow in spring, and with it, the last bit of strength I had left my body too. My legs gave way. I propped myself up against the wall so I wouldn't fall over. Mum's expression had changed immediately. The mar cold mask of, mask of strictness and detachment was gone. Mum looked the same as before all those quarrels. She finally saw my condition, my wet pants plastered with snow. Where have you been? What did I tell you, huh? I told you to stay home. Am I nothing to you too? I got afraid she would cry. I reached out to her like when I was very little and wanted her to cuddle me. But Mum regained her composure fast and put on her usual face. Her eyes shined like steel. Her voice rang out. Your dad can't find his cigarettes. Be honest, did you snatch them? Were you smoking in secret? I... there was someone chasing me. I... I thought... I stuttered as soon as I started explaining myself. Tears welled up in my eyes. Mum leaned towards me and sniffed my clothes like a beast, searching for the smell of tobacco. Then she squinted her eyes in suspicion and looked into the front yard. Her expression changed in an instant and she covered her mouth with her hand. Look over there! At the fence! My heart started thumping as if I became prey once again and my pursuers were following me in the field. I could swear that I've heard something scratch the door, just like in my nightmare. Mum beckoned me with her finger and I gathered all my remaining bravery to look into the kitchen window facing my fear. I could barely discern some hairy silhouettes swimming in snow through the icy winter patterns on the glass dogs. Just a small pack of strays, with no name and owner, barely reminding me of the hungry monsters that live on the edge of the forest. Oh boy, were you scared of them? I think they'd rather be scared of you, Anton. They were chasing me like a bunny. <laughs> and what if they're rabid? The smile had slowly disappeared from Mum's face. Now she looked at the dogs as if it was her first time seeing them. And what if they attack Olya? Mum? Oh, I wish your dad could just shoot them all. Mum, look, they're alive. Huh? What? 
Are they your friend or foe after all? Make up your mind. You're not a little kid anymore. Mum sighed in annoyance, and I felt so bitter that I bit my lower lip and fixed my gaze on the cobweb-ridden corner just to keep myself from crying. Well, some detective I am. In reality, I wasn't risking my life among monsters, but rather my pants among a pack of stupid strays. And what for? What use do I have for this? Mitten. Uh, of course. A dark and sticky mitten that belonged to the lost boy made a squishy sound in my hand. It seemed like I was clutching it the whole time. That's my trump card as a detective. I hurried to present this clue to my mum. Mum, look, this is Volva's mitten. Volva's mitten. Ooh. <laughs> That boy the police were asking about in the morning. It's drenched in blood. I found it hanging on a tree. I can show where. Let's call the police right away, like the officer had told us to. Mum, look! Ooh! A shadow of doubt slowly crept onto Mum's contorted face. As if she was trying to remember something distant. Like someone tries to remember their dream, but the images slip away. Stop it this moment! Ollie will go insane if she hears you. She's already got trouble sleeping and whines all the time. And you joke around like this. At that moment, I realised the mitten was actually wet from snow. There was no blood whatsoever. I wanted to sink through the floor from embarrassment. Come here, my boy who cried wolf. Oh, don't just stand there. Come take your pills. A golden-coloured pill, reminiscent of a dead wasp, fell onto my palm. I already took one during breakfast. Don't talk over me. I told you to stay home, and now you... Oh, Dad would have given you a good whipping for that. Come on, take it, or you won't be able to sleep at night, and you have school tomorrow. So I had to swallow the bitter medication, drinking it down with a similarly awful water that gave off a taste of chlorine. Maybe it wasn't Fover's mitten. Maybe it wasn't a mitten at all. Just like the forest monsters. And Olya's owl. Am I going mad? What's happening to me? Either the pill had an immediate effect, or my overexerted brain didn't let fear inside anymore. Serenity washed over me, bringing yawny indifference along with it. Anton, you done? See, you can do it when you try. Take off your coat. Are you asleep? No, Mum, I was just thinking. What about, I wonder? It's just something silly. Mum scrutinised me with suspicious eyes as if she wasn't sure she was looking at her own son and not some doppelganger that came from the forest. Is everything all right? You had the exact same expression when the policeman asked you about the window. I'm all right, Mum. She heaved a deep sigh. Fine. It seemed like the house had changed. The sofa's fabric had become discoloured. Fingerprints appeared on the bathroom tiles. The light bulbs also felt different, dimmer and yellower. Even the saliva inside my mouth had a different taste. A melody from Aladdin could be heard from the upper floor. Ollie was done re-watching her favourite Little Mermaid episodes and switched to other tapes. I slowly changed into my home clothes, stopped before the sink and studied my reflection in the mirror, like I was trying to solve one of those spot-the-difference puzzles. Then I went upstairs. Jafar's and Iago's voices died down. I walked past Olya's bedroom and slipped into my own. Okay, we've got some stuff to investigate. But... Oh, there's some... Oh, it's, it's Olya, isn't it, behind the curtain? That's fine. Um, but I think we'll leave it there. We're coming up to around about the hour mark, I think, on the video, which is you know, sort of generally around the time I try to, try to keep to. Um, seems like a good place to stop. We've calmed down a bit. And I'll t tell you, this was... Um, yeah, this is good, and it's also quite spooky i mean i think more than once i've had the little chill run up my neck as the hair stand on end so that's uh that's pretty cool it, it it's very good i think at building up the tension with the with the words and the the, the images on screen and the music as well ramping up volume I'll, I'll have to watch in the edit to see if my voice was actually able to be heard over the you know the ramping up music in those um tense parts but uh, ho hopefully it was okay so yeah so we'll definitely continue playing more of this through um next few days. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how long it'll take to work through the available I think three chapters, three acts that are currently available on the Steam Early Access um, 
But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, then please do hit the like button on the video and uh, subscribe to the channel as well if you've not done so already. That'd be amazing. And in the meantime, I'll hope to see you again for more Tiny Bunny. Bye for now. <laughs>